Bible, let's open up to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, we're going to be in verses 39 through 56. Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 56. And uh, as you're opening up there, I do want to say what a joy it is to get to gather together today. And now we get to turn our attention to the Word of the Lord. This is what every one of us in our lives, whether we're a mom or a dad or whatever else we may be, we desperately need God's Word. We need the Scriptures. Today I want us to turn our attention to the mother of our Lord, Mary. Mary. If you have your Bibles open there, I want you to go and stand with me out of reverence for the reading the words of our God. Luke writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in such a way that as the words on this page are being read, God Himself is speaking to you. Beginning verse 39. In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. Let's pray together. Dear God, we thank you for this opportunity we have to gather together with your people on your day. And God, as we give thanks for every good and perfect gift that comes from you today, we give thanks for mothers. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As someone who was one, is still and grew up being a son and who is now a dad and a husband, I have made an observation over the years. Being a mom is hard. It's, it's hard work. I've got a new perspective on it now as a pastor. But motherhood is just fraught with difficulty. One of the things I asked my wife as I prepared and prayed about what we might talk about here on Mother's Day and, and what text I might choose to preach on Mother's Day, I asked her what she needed to hear as a mom. And I thought what she said was so telling. So telling. She said, I need to be reminded of God's sovereignty. I need to be reminded of God's sovereignty, that He's in control, and that He holds our kids' futures in His hands. That's such an important thing for me to hear from my wife. And I wouldn't be surprised if there are many moms in here right now who feel the exact same way. I need to be reminded of God's sovereignty. And, and I wouldn't be surprised at whatever category you find yourself in on Mother's Day. Someone who's happy about Mother's Day, someone who's struggling with Mother's Day, perhaps you lost your mother, perhaps you're struggling in whatever way when it comes to Mother's Day. I don't think there's one of us here who doesn't need to be reminded of God's sovereignty. 
As a pastor, I, I love to talk to you all about what's going on in your lives. I love to hear uh, what you're struggling with, how you think about things. It's important for me to understand because I want to make sure that I understand where you are in life and what's going on with you. And so when I talk to mothers who are our peers, mothers who are kind of in the thick of things with their children, I hear similar themes over and over. And I see this in culture and society, I, I, I see this in TV shows, I see this in articles, and I hear it from the mouths of, of mothers even in our own church. I hear similar themes of what moms are struggling with over and over and over again. One big thing is guilt. One big thing is guilt. Moms struggle with guilt. Now, dads do that to some degree, but, but there seems to be a tendency for moms to really always feel like they're being drawn in a lot of different directions, maybe even more so than a dad does. And so they feel guilty depending on where they are. They feel guilty being drawn in lots of different directions. Oftentimes when I talk to moms, I hear the theme of fear. The theme of fear. They're afraid of, of how things are going to turn out. They're afraid of the job they're doing as a mom. You know, one thing I've noticed, one theme I hear all the time from moms is this, the struggle of comparison. The struggle of comparison. I don't know if y'all know this or not. So, some of you do, some of you live it, but some of you might not know this. There are people right now who make their living by trying to look cool on Instagram, which is a social media website. That's how they live. Trying to make it look like, you know, I've, my name's so-and-so, you know, my name's Rain or something like that. And uh, I've got uh, 52 kids and, uh, you know, we live in a camper together. And uh, it's perfectly decorated and we eat kale for dinner every night. And so people look at this and uh, for me it sounds miserable. You know, I'm praying for the poor guy that's living up in that camper with Rain. But uh, other people might look at this and think, gosh, I'm doing such a terrible, mo terrible job as a mom. I'm not in a renovated Winnebago, and my kids ate frozen chicken fingers for dinner. <laughs> Compare ourselves to one another. But that's just the negative side. There's a positive side, obviously as well. Positive themes I hear. The joy and hope and love that's present and what it means to be a mom. And so often, it's so hard to focus on the second set of things because the first set of things are such a burden. God created mothers for unique reasons. As we've already testified this morning, there's not a soul here who in one way or another has not been impacted by mother. And, and even those who are struggling today recognize that what's missing today is a reflection of what's so wonderful about God's unique design of motherhood. What better example, what better place do we have to turn to but to look to the example of Mary the mother of our Lord, to learn more about God's design for motherhood. God's design for motherhood. And you might even say this is God's design for parenthood. God's design for motherhood. I just want to show you three points this morning, three points that are from Mary's example of God's design for moms. Here's the first. God chose mothers for His plan. God chose mothers for His plan. You know, if you really look at verses 39 through 56, one thing you'll notice is the utmost importance that's demonstrated here, the utmost importance that God has placed on motherhood in His great plan for the ages. Notice, notice what's going on particularly in verses 39 through 44. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth, her cousin. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby, that's John the Baptist, leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit comes on Elizabeth, and Elizabeth begins to 
prophesy. She exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me? What? That the mother of my Lord, the mother of my Lord, should come to me. For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. There's so many things to note here, but the thing I want you to focus on is this idea that God used Mary and Elizabeth, two women who were not otherwise noteworthy women, two women who you wouldn't expect. You know, one of the things we do for our daughters, my, our daughter, I only have one, the thing we do for our daughter is my wife found this little collection of books that are just, you know, little picture books, kids' books, and they're great women, great women, kids' books. And so we've got all kinds of women, and we want to just show our daughter these great women from history, so we buy her these books a lot and uh, demonstrate that to her. You know, Mary and Elizabeth probably wouldn't have been in those books. We, we, they probably wouldn't have had a Mary or an Elizabeth book in their collection. These are not women that the world would have looked at and just praised profusely because of how great they are, how wonderful they were. And they were wonderful in God's sight, there's no question about that. Holy women, godly women, the things that matter most were reflected in their lives. And yet what we see here is God used Mary and his Elizabeth, these two women, in his grand plan for the ages. And on top of that, Luke here is focusing in so many ways in the first couple of chapters of his gospel. He is focusing, maybe more than any other gospel writer, on Mary's perspective. If you were to read through uh, chapters 1 and 2, you would find yourself uh, recognizing and realizing that so much of what Luke shares seems to be from Mary's personal reflections. We see just a little bit of evidence of that in chapter 2, verse 51. Jesus went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And what happens? And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. Seems as if Luke did, uh, Luke says that he considered a lot of different sources seems as if Luke did some sort of interview with Mary or found some source where he could draw on Mary's personal experiences and, and in so many ways really relies on Mary's experiences, it seems like, in the first two chapters of the book of Luke. And so here we see then this importance of Mary, this exaltation of Mary in the pages of Scripture, this highlighting of the work of the mother of the Lord. I, I think Elizabeth's confession is so important. The mother of my Lord. You know, she's not just focused on the baby in the womb, even though he is what matters most. Nonetheless, she is focused. She is excited about the place that Mary plays in the Lord Jesus Christ's life. Doesn't it clearly follow when we begin to see the emphasis that Luke plays on the role that Mary and Elizabeth played in the lives of John the Baptist and our Lord Jesus Christ, doesn't it follow very clearly to you, it does to me, how important motherhood is to God and how much the work of mothers matters to God because of the highlight which He gives for the mother of our Lord? And one of the things sometimes we do as Baptists is we start getting real nervous when people talk about Mary. We work real hard at making sure, you know, we're not, you know, we're not Catholic. We don't, we don't pray to Mary, all those kind of things. We want to make sure everybody knows that, you know. But I think so often in our attempt to make sure that we're so clearly Protestant that we've really relegated Mary to a place that's lower than what the Bible gives her. We, we, we miss the importance of Mary in the narrative of scriptures. I hope and pray that all women and all mothers can be encouraged by the reality of how God chose to use women. God chose to use women. If you look at the stories of the gospels and the stories of the, the life of the Lord, so often it's women 
who get what's going on way before the men know what's going on. Everybody's like, yep, that's about right. <laughs> Sounds like my house. The women go to the tomb and recognize Jesus isn't there before anybody else. No, so they're the first people to see that the Lord has risen. Women here, before these babies are even born, know something's going on in a way that maybe others don't. The Bible's choosing to highlight that, this exalted, special role that women play in the story of the gospel. Sisters, I hope and pray that you'll reject the idea that the culture has kind of force-fed us. That in order to value women, you have to do it just like the world does. Now listen, I, I'll be the first to admit, and I want everyone to know, that I don't think that the Lord's church has always done a good job, the best job, or even a great job, of exalting and honoring women like we should. Don't, don't mishear me. I'm, I'm not trying to cop out and say, you know, we've always done it perfectly. That's, that's not the case at all. In fact, I think a lot of Christian people over the years have had some unbiblical ideas, and they've used the Bible to kind of hide behind it. Views on all kinds of things. I think there's a lot of misogyny out there in the world. And the people blame the Bible for their sin. And I, don't, I, don't, I don't like it one bit, and I, I'll guarantee that the Lord hates it. The Lord hates for us to use the Bible to cover up sin. He hates it. So don't mishear me and, and, and hear me say that I think we've always done a perfect job of honoring and respecting women in all the ways that we should as, as the church as a whole. But what I also want to say is the way to do that is not necessarily exactly like the world does it. Because what we have to recognize is we live in a culture that out of one side of their mouth talks about how highly we ought to view women and how much respect we ought to have for women and, and how, how wonderfully uh, high of a view we ought to have of women and out of the other side of their mouth are constantly spewing out things that cause us to objectify women. We ought to have a real high view of women, but let's just make sure they're always wearing a bathing suit when we do it. That's not how God wants us to honor women. I want you to see, women, that God values you not for who you are on the outside, but for who you are on the inside, for your whole person, for everything that you are. And I hope all women and all mothers can be encouraged by the reality of how God has chosen to use women. God chose mothers for His plan. And second of all, God asks mothers to trust Him. God asks mothers to trust Him. I love verse 45. Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. God asks mothers to trust Him. Parenthood can be really, really scary. Parenthood, I, now I'm getting in some territory I understand. Parenthood can be scary. I can remember when Whitney was pregnant, all three times, honestly. But really, especially the first time. I can remember thinking, I cannot wait till we have this baby so I don't have to worry anymore. <laughs> and then, I can remember bringing that baby home in a car and going about 25 miles an hour down I-65 in Louisville, Kentucky, going back to the parsonage at Sunnyside Baptist Church. I remember looking at Whitney and saying, you know, they just let us have her. <laughs> you know, y'all got a car seat in there? Yep, all right, see you later. Okay, here we go. Here's a burp cloth, have fun. I remember thinking, man, this guy, this little baby, they feel so fragile. I'm just a nervous wreck the first six months. If I break this child, what's going to happen? Glad they got flexible bones, you know? Thank you, Lord. I remember thinking, man, I can't wait for this baby to start walking and kind of toddling around a little bit, then I don't have to worry anymore. <laughs> 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 
Then you think, man, I can't wait for this. You know, when they get a little older, I don't have to worry more, get them potty trained. And, you know, I, I, you, you want your kids to be potty trained so badly, you know. And then you realize that means i got to stop every time they need to go to the bathroom when we're in the car. <laughs> Parenthood can be so scary. Now I've recognized I'm just going to worry for the rest of my life. Unless I can entrust my kids to a sovereign God. Unless I can do what Mary did here and believe that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Now, God's not made any promises about how healthy or happy or anything else my kids will be. He's not promised that they'll be successful. He's not made promises about any of these things. But God has told me He is good. And I know from the Bible that God loves my kids more than He does, more than I do. He loves, he loves them. He cares about them. So I just have to entrust my children to a sovereign God. You see, God is no less in control for you and your kids than He was for Mary and her son. Mary wasn't born some sort of super Christian who just naturally had more faith than anyone else. It's a struggle to believe these things. As much for Mary, if not more for Mary, than it is for us. And yet what is Elizabeth doing? She's exhorting her to do the same thing that Elizabeth has done in her own life. Trust God. Trust God. These are two women who are trusting God. And guess what? Both of their sons would be murdered for God's glory. Both of their sons prophet soon to tell Mary that a, her heart will be pierced with sorrow as well. God's not called them to something easy, but God has called them to something glorious. It's no easier for you to trust God than it was for Mary to trust God. And so God is asking mothers and fathers and people to trust Him. God's asking you today, if you're struggling, if you're suffering, God is asking you to trust Him, to entrust yourself to a sovereign God. God is in control. And He works all things together for good. For those who love Him and are called according to His purpose been shocked by things along the way i couldn't understand why god would do it or how god would do it that way but i don't have the answers to all those things even now but i've had to learn to love god and trust god through through those difficulties god asks you this morning to trust him to trust him that leads us to our last point God uses mothers for His glory. God uses mothers for His glory. At the end of the day, each and every one of us has the most unbelievable honor in the cosmos. No matter what position God's put us in, no matter what place God has put us in, no matter what vocation, what calling God has given each and every one of us, we have the highest calling of all, and that is to bring glory unto God. If you're a Christian in here today, you and I share the exact same primary vocation. I do it as a preacher, right? Paul talks about this in Corinthians when he he talks about how some people might think, well, I don't glorify God like the preacher does. I don't don't glorify God like this spiritual all-star does. What does the Bible say? He needs every kind of person in his church. He's put us all here for a reason. We're like a body. So you may be just unbelievably weird I mean, great and amazing, right? But, but, you may be super strong, really strong, but if you're missing a tongue, you can't talk. Missing your eyes, you can't see. Missing your ears, you can't hear. And so what God does then is he puts a body together that's got all the things that are needed. And so what each of us have to remember is that whatever place, whatever lot God has given us in life he has given us the ability to glorify him it's something Mary recognized and she writes a song a poem over throughout Christian history it's become known as the Magnificat comes from the Latin Vulgate translation of the Bible and this word that Mary begins with my soul magnifies the Lord verse 46 in the Latin would be Magnificat 
And this beautiful hymn, this song, and I've preached just on this before. I don't have time to get into all of it right now, but it reflects Mary's heart when she realizes or continues to reflect on how she is to be used of God for His glory. What does being used of God produce in our hearts and lives? The first thing it produces is praise. Someone who's being used of God praises God. My soul, what? Magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Being used of God produces praise. Now so often it's easy for being used of God to produce self-praise. We want to be seen. We want people to know how good we are, how good we've got it. We want to be Instagram mom. Real cool. Instagram dad. Everything's good and together. But being used of God ought to produce praise of God, not of ourselves. What else does being used of God produce? Praise unto God, but it also produces humility before God and man. What does Mary say? For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. Mary doesn't say, God looked at me, saw how great I was, and decided that's, that's who I want to bring the Son of God, into the world. No, what does she say? God has looked upon my humble estate, the humble estate of His servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Why? For He who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is His name. Mary's not saying it's something great that I've done. She is expressing humility before God. And that's something each and every one of us in the room must recognize. Every good and perfect gift is from above. We're stewards of all the good things that God has given us in our life, and that includes our children. We must have humility before God when He blesses us, when He uses us. But Mary goes on. He has shown strength with His arm. He has scattered the proud. He has brought down the mighty. He has exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things. The rich He has sent away empty. He has helped His servant Israel in remembrance of His mercy. As He spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to His offspring forever, Mary is recognizing her dependence on God. His people didn't do this. God did this for His people. God is bringing Jesus into the world for His people. Mary is recognizing then what Christ is offering her is being used of God and it is rendering in her life praise and humility and dependence on God. And I want you to think in the room today, mothers and all Christians, what joyful, blessed peace that very thought brings. Because in... Instead of feeling afraid, you can trust in God. Because you're dependent on God, not on yourself. Instead of being afraid like I so often am, Lord, I know I'm going to mess these kids up. I recognize if I could, I would. (laughs) But we trust God. We trust God. So that we don't have to fear Him, but we... Trust Him and praise Him for what He's done. Christ offered Mary not guilt, but assurance. God is who He says He is, and He offers the same thing to us. Not all the time trying to add up how good we're performing, but looking to Christ who performed perfectly for us and trusting Him and having assurance in Him. And not having the pressure that we have so often have to deal with, but humility and dependence before God. That it's not based on our performance. Now, we want to be the best parents, the best Christians we can be, but that's out of a place of reflecting on God's grace and mercy toward us, not trying to do it the best ourselves. Oh, sisters. Oh, sisters. God will use you for His glory. God will use you fighting back tears Praying and longing for children, God will use you for His glory. Weeping over that which you've lost and that which you thought you would have, God will use you for His glory. Depressed and angry at yourself for taking out your anger on your children, God 
can still use you for His glory. Worried and fearful over how things might turn out, God will still use you for His glory. God is capable to do that precisely because of the little baby that Mary carried in her womb. And at the sound of her voice, John the Baptist leaped for joy. My hope and my prayer is that the thought of that baby, that man, that very Son of God, will give you joy as well. I want to offer an invitation this morning. If you've never put your trust in Jesus for the first time, I want to offer you this invitation today that you can put your faith in Jesus after you've repented of your sins. And I believe He will save you today. The Bible says He will save you. If you need to be saved today, turn from your sins and repentance and turn to God in faith through Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Second of all, you may be a Christian, you may say, Pastor, I just need some time to pray. For whatever reason that may be, this altar is open for you and if you need someone to pray with you, I'd be happy to do that this morning. And finally, you may be looking for a church home. I'd love to talk to you today about what it means for you to be a member here at First Baptist Church. After this prayer, I want to invite you to come. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, our God, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. And God, we thank you for this opportunity we have to gather together on the Lord's day. And Lord, I pray that you would move among us during this time. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.